that Mark would not be here. But we're on and we'll go ahead and get get started. Thanks to everybody for showing up. Um, if anyone needs a restroom, they're out the door to the right. If we have to vacate the building for any reason, we go back down the steps, out the front door, to the left, and then meet all the other folks that are in this building out in the parking lot behind the building. We haven't had to do that yet, and hopefully we won't, we won't need to. Uh, for anyone that's uh, streaming live, if you go to route29solutions.org, go on the top menu, pick the panels and meetings, and then advisory panel documents, you'll see the May 14th meeting is the agenda the presentation is also is also there uh, let's go ahead and do our introductions Pete Pete Porsche CMA property the orals with uh, planning district commission and MB MPO Morgan Butler Southern Environmental Law Center Chris Engel with the city of Charlottesville Karen Weiner Charlottesville Fashion Square Peter Ryan Shane consultant to Express Car Wash John? John Lynch of uh, VDOT Public for District. Joel Denunzi of VDOT Charlottesville Residency. Dave Covington, VDOT Charlottesville Residency. Debbie Messina, Philip Chiquette Company. Adam Mercer, RSH. Hal Jones, Charlottesville Residency, VDOT. Lou Hatter, Project Communications Manager. And the call up VDOT IT support. Keeps everything going. Thank you very, very much. Um, go ahead. Uh, uh, from our live streaming last meeting, April the 30th, there were about, what, 25 more viewers. April 16th, we had 38, there were 63. At our last meeting, 141 streams, so a few more streams that were shorter, 18 minutes instead of 34 minutes. So we had some extra people on last month, and or last meeting, and that's Good. Go ahead, Lynn. Uh, as far as the uh, feedback or any comments that we got through the website, there was one email comment. Uh, no new, uh, no new online comments in the provide input piece. The comment that was received. Hello, Mayor. How are you? The comment that was received uh, was a suggestion that. VDOT provide temporary TODs, the transit-oriented directional signs, for all the businesses affected by construction. And what VDOT is currently doing with, the, I think, together with the county, is considering a temporary waiver of the TODs participation criteria, the application fee, and the annual fee for businesses during construction. Waiving the criteria, as I understand it, would allow more businesses possibly to have a sign during construction. But either the businesses, the county, or the project would have to absorb the cost for materials and installations. If there are uh, anyone, anyone uh, that is interested in seeing what the Todd's criteria look like because after construction the the program would revert back to this criteria you can check it out on this link it's at uh, the VDOT's link this link will take you right to the criteria or if you're if you're at VDOT's website in their search bar you can type Todd's or IDSP which I don't remember what that stands for, something, something signing program. Uh, and it will take you to that spot on their, on their website. But I want to make sure I have this correct. I think there's no decisions that have been made here yet that VDOT is still working with the county on how this might work during construction. <clears throat> Could you refresh your memory what the acronym TOTS stands for? Tourist Oriented Directional Sign. And those are the blue signs with yes. the name and the mileage to the place. Yes. Maybe it's the blue background, the white sign, 
Chittery's hot dogs, and I do think Point it has. Miles, yes, like yes. Okay. But there's a there's a set of criteria for what type of businesses can and can't be on Todd's, and part of the discussion is whether or not to waive that criteria during con during construction. I believe I've got this right. For example. Um, I think a tobacco shop is, I think, excluded on the normal criteria. Now, whether or not that would or wouldn't be allowed during construction is part of the discussion going on. Um, just your last comment there, the during construction, I, I think it would be worthwhile to, to define that term um, because we're talking about having impact during construction, but in fact, some people might think construction has already started. I mean, there, there has been an impact on certainly on yeah. the aesthetic and, and, and mm -hmm. will be more so, but this group or VDOT may not consider construction to have started. And so when we start, this is an overall deal, but yes. specifically, we need to determine when when is the start of construction. Well, I, I mean, from VDOT's point of view, I know it's safe to say construction has started Okay. And construction would end October 2017. So, so, so for right. design ordinances or these sign discussions that would be during the period of construction, we are in that. And we are in that. We are in that period. I mean, we're in that. Right. We're in that period. And fair enough. Those deliberations need to conclude if we're going to do something. So right. Yeah, I agree. As a practical matter, are there limits that could come into play in terms of yeah. the spacing? I mean, they just yeah. talked about there being something, some of the neighborhood of 200 businesses alone potentially impacted by a RIO. Just have sign after sign after sign every foot of that area. It seems, seems like it could there be are practical there. limits. I think that's part of the discussions that are going back and, and forth. Got it. But they do need to they need to wrap up. I mean, either we can or can't do this. If you look at the businesses that are permitted, the types of businesses permitted and the types excluded, it's, I mean, you know, there are a lot of business. It's all encompassing. Hey, Brad, hey, you get my hat out of your way. Um, I have a question on the yes. yes. And if we've covered it, I apologize. What is the process for a business to apply to be on the top sign? You know, Karen, I don't. I, I don't remember the process, and I don't know if any. I I know it's defined here, and there's an application, and the fees are specified there at that link. It's a contractor. Yeah, it's a contractor that we use for the program, and if you go to that link and go to the bottom, there's a phone number and email address that you can contact them and, and ask them. The contractor that manages the interstate logo signs for VDOT also manages the Todd sign. But if you can't find what you need there, let me know and I'll, and I'll get it for you. Pete's point as well, construction has already started with yes. the hotels and, and businesses that are right there at that 250 that are being disrupted already. You know how that, mm -hmm. they can also take advantage of that. Yes. When Mar I will circle back with Mark to see where those discussions are in the that particular one would be a city discussion. I mean, that would be a city discussion. In, in yeah, terms of right. it, it is the city looking at anything down there? Um, I do not know the answer to that. No, uh, we hadn't discussed it with regard to the 29250 interchange project. It was more that discussion was more <coughs> focused at prior PSI. I mean, it, I'm not saying we're I'm certainly doing. more focused on that personally, but I do yeah. think that there are a significant number of businesses that are impacted, especially from a tour standpoint. When we get into, you know, visitors to UVA, they're staying in a lot of those hotels and some of those restaurants. You know, Dave, for my two cents, I, I think we ought to look at it for Route 29 Solutions. I think is the way to, to do it. So let us chat about that a little bit, a little bit more. Uh, report on panel feedback from our, um, it should be the April 30th meeting, my bad there. 
Uh, we're asked to review the key components of Burkmar preliminary plans. We're going to do that later today as item seven. Uh, consider possible alternatives to the to that merge situation at Route 250 and 29. Uh, the, the team has looked at that, determined that the current situation, the current maintenance traffic plan is the preferred one. Uh, Joel, if I've got this right, from what we've information we've gotten from uh, law enforcement, there there have been three incidents, all rear ends there at that merge uh, in the in the work zone and when you consider the timing of them which was very near the time that the maintenance traffic plan was put into place consider all the options including uh, Pete the one you suggested I think it's VDOT's recommendation that we stick with what we have there continue to monitor it uh, and see where that goes. But that's where we that's where we are. There was an accident in January. There was an incident in January. Then I think two in March. Two in March. One in, then one, in, one, in eight. one a couple weeks ago. Yeah. So you had yeah. two that happened pretty soon after. Pretty soon. It was implemented, but it seems like people are getting used to it. And had one yeah. Since then, so it might have been last time. But that team will be keeping their eye on the situation there. Uh, oh yeah, you ask us to keep you posted on the co-location with uh, the design builder team, and I know the folks started moving in this week. Yes. Um, and Dave, you're there now. I am, yes. and I, I got a hard time that I'm not located in the residency, physical residency anymore, but still located in the balance of the residency, just a different office. Uh, there was a question about did, did the contractor at McIntyre receive an incentive? Chris, I think I've got this correct. Uh, uh, 185000 of 250 possible was paid out as a part one incentive for the completion of bridge and parkway opening. There's another 250 additional incentive that's tied to full project completion two days from now. And I don't know where that stands or if I guess we'll know we'll know at our next meeting what happened with part two. Uh, so that's that. Uh, the integrated schedule for the design build the three design build projects has been updated. You'll find it at your desk. It's also posted. So for those that are watching, uh, you'll see under the May 14th uh, meeting. There's the agenda, the presentation, and an updated schedule, which looks like this. But as I said, you have it at your desk. Uh, this one has been cut down just for the three design build projects. We're also getting updates uh, for the, the official schedule for the Best Buy, Best Buy project. And we'll continue to work with the city on, uh, on bills that. <laughs> So you have this information, which by no means is a detailed schedule, but gives you some idea of the type of activities happening uh, between the three projects. Open discussion. Brad? Chris? Karen? Henry? We we had great headway, pizza, beer, we had all kinds of <laughs> no. No, I'm teasing, of course. Mayor? Chip. You know I've always got something. <laughs> um, I, I kicked this idea around um, internally and and then uh, Lou and I spoke yesterday about it. Um, I think it's a, it, it might be a good opportunity with the resource of Route 29 Solutions uh, website. Um, certainly, the, the the infrastructure exists to be able to put a time lapse video together. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is me. I was trying to put this video out there, this project out there, as as look how fast we can get it done and how efficiently and all that. So let's take a picture every day and build a time lapse of this project. Um, I, I would suggest doing it as quickly as we can, maybe in a couple of locations. And post them to the to the website. 
Um, I don't think it would cost very much. It would certainly help to, to yeah. we show the project bill. This is in the works. It's something that we are looking at right now. We've actually been talking about it for quite a while. We've done this on other projects. And what we do is, is put a link on the website that people can click on, and it takes you right to the camera. It shows right. you a static image, and you can play the time lapse leading up to that date. Usually, they take a picture every seven minutes. Oh, well. uh, very useful tools. That right. It would help us go back and, and and tell our story at the end of the project, as well as, as possibly learn some lessons from it. But I think what I hear Pete saying is, should, should we start that now? and not wait for the... My recommendation is going to be that we start it as soon as we can. Let us come back to you yeah. with a schedule for when we'll have that. We'll, come back to the whole well, to the whole group, yeah. yeah. I mean, the I'd, big you. It would be great if we could get it done. I mean, I, it's something that, that we may do internally um, just to keep everybody honest. Then we better start tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be filming your camera. That's fine. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's a good that that is a good suggestion, and that is a tool that VDOT used in several places. I'm working on a project down in the Hampton Roads where we've done the same thing, and it's it it is quite a quite effective, and not only in demonstrating to the public, but really for your own benefit as as well. Okay. Anything else? Think we could come back with a plan on that by the next meeting? Yes. Okay. Good. Good deal. Good deal. Uh, our uh, submission schedule is the is the same. I think we're getting closer to the 60% plans on uh, plants mill mm -hmm. on Raya. Late late this month. Late this month. So still late late this month. No changes, no changes there. Any questions on that schedule? Okay, Dave, our project updates. Okay, if you would, would you like me to do it from here or up I'd here? like you to do it from out here so okay. we don't have the net turning syndrome. Very good. MTS. Calling. <laughs> okay, good afternoon. Uh, we'll start with the Route 29 250 interchange project as usual. If you have driven through this work zone recently, you will know that all of the current work and work for the near future really is about drainage. There's a lot of pipe out there. There's a lot of uh, inlets that are positioned in the median and off to the side, and all that's got to go on the ground here very shortly. So work this week, obviously, surveying layout of storm drain system. That's begun. That's going to continue for the next few weeks, I'm sure. Installation of the uh, storm drain, there is a pipe that has to cross beneath the 29 southbound lanes. I believe that's going to be a jack and bore operation. We may have some nighttime lane closures and detours as a result of that. Lou's going to keep us informed of all of that through the uh, regularly scheduled uh, work zone alerts, traffic alerts. Uh, removal of topsoil from the 29 median, that is nearing completion. You've probably seen out there they've removed a lot of that topsoil and vegetative material. Seeding disturbed areas along the Route 250 ramp. This is, you can't quite see it from the roadway, but if you were in the neighborhood on the other side, you'll see all that vegetation stripped off or they'll be building the retaining walls. All that has to be seeded and stabilized before they come in and do the next phase. Uh, Drainage work in the Route 29 median, that's a large majority of that scope of work for that project. And installing safety fence at the base of the Route 250 westbound ramp. So this gives a kind of a barrier there so children and dogs and cats aren't straying into the work zone at the back of some of these residential properties where that work's going to be occurring. Next week, continuation of drainage work in the median and continued construction of the stormwater management basin and the pipes that give water to that basin. Any questions on 29250 interchange ramp? Okay, excellent. Adaptive signal work. Uh, work this week is continuing pulling wires through the conduit that's already been installed in the ground uh, in the past few weeks and making those tie-ins to get the adaptive signal system ready to go live come 2017 when the projects are complete. 
Also, a junction, some junction boxes at Woodbrook in that same tie-in needs to occur. Uh, and also, uh, completing cleanup work at Polar Grounds next week. So they've, they've done some directional bores, go out, put seed, straw, get all that back to the way it was before they started. So the good news is that barring any unforeseen weather delays, the phase one of the adaptive signals will be complete May 18th. So that's almost a month ahead of schedule. Anybody have any questions? Hey, Dave, that? just yes. I know it's redundant, but remind everybody again what phase one is about and its purpose and what it isn't. Right, right. Phase one is installing all the infrastructure to get ready for in the future when uh, they put the controllers in the cabinets and basically flip the switch and, and turn on the adaptive system. So phase one involves putting conduit on the ground, fiber optic cables, running power where it didn't exist before, cameras on the signal poles, all those items that need to occur before we can actually put this system into place. So that's what's finishing up this month, next week actually. Uh, and then come phase two, it'll be a very quick process to go install controllers that haven't already been installed in the boxes that already exist and, and turn the system on. Turn the system on is a little simplistic, but that's effectively what it is. Make the system active. Any other questions on adaptive? Morgan? I think this weekend is UVA's graduation. Is that, is that Yes. Right? Are there any, any, has any thought been given to relaxing the construction zones during? Restricting the them. Yeah, restricting them. Uh, right. Yeah. Like, so they won't be as, as restrictive as, as usual? Well, we'll restrict the work that's allowed to happen. All the lanes will be open to traffic and make sure that folks can get to those activities and, and get away from them and not have to deal with excessive traffic as a result of construction. Right. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Hey, Dave, um, yeah. I would add on that phase one, um, it allows our traffic engineers also to monitor the corridor through those cameras at all times right now, or as soon as it's complete, and also to make uh, real-time changes if needed. That's a great point, thank you. Uh, part of the timing of doing phase one before physical construction at RIO at 29 widening uh, is to have those cameras so that the Traffic Operations Center in Stanton can monitor that in real time, can make adjustments to those signals. So if we have any issues in the field, uh, during construction, they can actually come in and modify the, the signal timing uh, to alleviate that congestion that might be building up uh, in one of the movements. Thanks, Joel. Okay. Rio grade separated intersection. Work this week, uh, a little bit of light selective clearing in the northeast quadrant. There's not a lot of vegetation there to clear. A few small trees are doing that. Uh, minor demolition in the northeast quadrant. I think there was a, uh, a, a trash rack or, or barrier for their dumpsters that, that had to be demolished at the old Outback building. They're working on that. Uh, we did hold our first monthly meeting with Lane Foreman this week to discuss project status, upcoming work, schedule, uh, those types of things. Uh, submit and review preliminary lighting analysis. This is just one example of a submittal that's been made over the past week or so. Since Friday, we've received over 17 submittals from the design builder for various, you know, inside baseball kind of things, you know, some environmental reports, status reports, schedule updates, those types of things. So there's this constant, uh, almost constant feeding of information from the design builder to VDOT. We review, get back to them. It's very active right now on the design front. Uh, uh, work next week, uh, continue minor demolition in the northeast quadrant. They've also, uh, next week they'll be starting to actually move dirt to uh, construct the uh, duck bank. It's a shared use duck bank that's going to be going in in that quadrant. Uh, so you'll actually start seeing some dirt moving next week. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the lighting analysis? You and I talked a little bit about it. Yeah, this is a, a preliminary lighting analysis that shows um, what lighting is required, what the illumination of the roadway and sidewalks, what those levels are. Uh, we're just starting our review of this to make sure that it meets the requirements that we have in the RFP as far as lighting. Uh, foot candles. Foot candles, exactly. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that uh, 
we may miss the opportunity to put in decorative pedestrian lighting which the city is very good at putting them in a little bit at a time all over the town and I think this would be a great opportunity to create a little bit more of an urban feel if we get those lights and I'm worried that yes if you take the other lights that are meant to illuminate the roadway high enough and strong enough then you can say that strictly by foot candles they're not necessary but from a point of view of urban aesthetics I think in this this part of the analysis and all of the lights that are installed at that intersection we have a requirement in the contract that they meet a certain aesthetic quality in fact King Luminaire was the example that we used which is one that the county has been using it was used in Crozet in the streetscape project there which is a very decorative light also LED lights for to lower energy consumption so anything that is installed will be have a decorative nature we're very keen on that we will absolutely have pedestrian level lighting on the bridge the crosswalk there it's just do we need supplemental lighting pedestrian pedal stool type lighting along the sidewalks in the vicinity of the intersection is yet to be determined I mean that's the impacted area that is where businesses are that are losing 50 to 70 percent of their traffic and anything that can make it more attractive to some people say well you know I won't go into the express lanes I'll go on the side lanes it will take me a little bit longer but I see something attractive so a day I agree with Henry on this point and I knew that I don't want any you have it on film it's on it's on record people have heard it no I mean and I think we talked about it very early early on that at least in my head I see an opportunity for us to do what we need to do in terms of light lighting the through lanes but from a design kind of attitude point of view should be looking at those local lanes like local somewhat more of a local city street feel that that is inviting that sends a different message not only operationally but how it how it looks so I would second that encouragement that we've got an opportunity here that we want to make sure we appropriately explore and discuss we we're not just looking at the through lanes the requirement of the contract is includes the local lanes the intersection itself really we had a requirement in there that within a hundred feet of the intersection we had to have enough illumination for not only vehicles but for pedestrians on the sidewalks as well well the thing is those local lanes are not a hundred feet long correct and as I say strictly from the foot candle level as I said before you can have something that is very efficient just use the lights that are illuminating the roadways including express lanes and just make them tall enough and strong enough and you will have the foot candle level but that's not the intent because I think if you'll remember again this was months ago I even had Joel check into the specs for the city that's where we got the king luminaire stuff like that's where we got that's where we got that's where we're looking at that I think we're I think we're headed along the same the same path there but I'm equally interested in seeing that yeah okay well right now the report we have is a lot of you know numbers on the pavement that you know doesn't show you know specifically the aesthetic I saw candle curves that's what they're called yes I remember I'm trying to go the other way it's definitely more technical yeah we'll certainly keep that in mind when we perform this review analysis any other questions on router GSI orange fence the orange construction fence that's on the northeast quadrant now is that going to come 
or is there going to be more substantial fencing or what's the there will be there will be safety fencing in areas that's required by the activities that are going on and generally if there's a trench that's being excavated for installation of for instance this duck bank we don't want somebody apparently walking into that so we do have to protect that there there will be instances it will occur in other areas of the project yes as far as the timing and exact locations that's kind of still in the planning process any other questions I don't want to speak for the county directly but I'll tell you what I've heard is that there is that is part of the package that's going before the board next month I believe which is relaxation or expediting some of those reviews and possibly eliminating some of the application fees for that and some of the ARB requirements maybe relaxing those I don't know the specifics of that but certainly we can talk with Mark and try to get some of that information yes you are correct that will go through the county any other questions okay about 29 widening work this week we did receive the phase one archaeological report as well as a couple of other environmental reports to keep us up to date on the status of work that the design builder is doing to meet the requirements of the contract as well as the legal requirements for environmental policies also they have been digging utility test holes at nighttime under lane closures this will occur into next week as well they're locating horizontally and vertically all these utilities that are under the ground getting that information so that they can put the finishing touches on the utility relocation plans any questions on 29 widening okay work mark extended work this week we did receive the stage one bridge report and the stage one bridge report is it's kind of like the 30% plans for roadway so we received this report it tells us the type the size and the length generally the bridge and VDOT reviews it FH well FHWA won't review for far but VDOT will review it and determine you know are we satisfied that this bridge isn't going to have substantial changes that might affect the rest of the project so it is a very important milestone for that project we did meet with the some residents along the alignment to follow back up with them and and show them the progress to date and make sure that they understand what the project looks like to them how it affects their property and offer them some opportunities to provide input on the design which they did take us up on which is great also the contractor is installing safety fence the orange fence that you were mentioning earlier around the wetlands and the only cemetery that's adjacent to the project it's not the cemetery is not affected by the project but we want to make sure that somebody doesn't mistakenly get outside of the bounds of the project limits and impact that cemetery in any way work next week we'll be performing over-the-shoulder plan reviews periodically on on this project element as well as the others so that's kind of a snapshot of where we're at right now with work more that's kind of game gaining steam in the design process anybody have any questions about work more they will go through the plan review in the next agenda right okay Hillsdale sure real quick on Hillsdale working to schedule a stakeholder committee meeting there's enough taking place now that it's time to re-engage the stakeholder committee that was put together a couple years ago actually I believe this meeting with VDOT the county and the city has been scheduled almost we're getting there checking schedules with respect to the stormwater management 
and they're executing agreements with property owners for some borings. <coughs> Moving into uh, the upcoming weeks, they're finalizing the environmental reevaluation, uh, reviewing the final plan set, and starting some work, I believe, on the appraisal process on several of the parcels. So that's the, that's the update from Hillsdale. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions on Hillsdale? This project is kind of picking up steam as well and, and, and hitting the kind of the, the final stride of the design process and we look forward to, to getting those uh, right-of-way plans and moving forward with right-of-way acquisition. Okay. okay, Dave, just go right into item seven. Okay, just so I don't forget anything, I've got a few notes here, but we did have a, what we're, what we're calling an over-the-shoulder review meeting on Burkmar with Lane Corman. Uh, this was kind of a moving from 30% plans to 60% plans, and you'll recall that the 30% plans were effectively what was in the technical proposal, and we kind of pulled those out and put them on the website in their own special place so they're a little easier to find. But we want to feel confident that the design is heading in the right direction. The design builder wants to feel confident that the design is heading in the right direction. So we held this meeting, and um, it was on April 30th. And we met with their construction staff and their design staff, which is important because their construction staff is very engaged in the design process. So this minimizes changes later, makes us feel more confident in the final product. Uh, there really are no major changes from the technical proposal plans. They haven't had any horizontal alignment changes as far as the actual location of the roadway or location of the bridge. But there were a few uh, uh, changes that don't really affect the, the construction or the aesthetics or the design of the roadways, but I'll go over those with you. Um, they optimized the south abutment type. And what does that mean? Well, when they submitted their technical proposal, they were kind of guessing a little bit of where the rock was and, and how the abutment would be designed. And the abutment is that element right where you drive from the roadway onto the bridge that supports the end of the bridge. And they've gone out and done geotechnical drilling and they found out, okay, here's the depth of rock, here's how competent that rock is. Let's go ahead and do a little bit more design on our abutment. So they changed it from a wing style to more of like a, a U-back, which is very traditional. I'm sure you've seen it on a lot of bridges where the abutment retaining wall would be perpendicular to the road and then come back parallel to the road. So it kind of minimizes the footprint of that as well. So it, it is good from a uh, environmental perspective. They have changed their pier type. Um, piers are, you know, what holds up the bridge and, and uh, they have what was called a hammerhead uh, pier type in their technical proposal. And this is one single element that comes up and spans out at the top. I'm sure you've seen this on a lot of bridges. It's very traditional. The problem with that is it has a large footprint. It has one single large spread footing. We have a lot of requirements in place avoiding the river, avoiding wetlands, avoiding archaeological sites, uh, or minimizing impacts to that. So they went with what's called a multi-column vent. It's a three-column vent. So there's three piers underneath the bridge. This allows them to greatly reduce the size of that footing. So they have three drilled shafts, three holes uh, that contain the, the foundations. And this allows them to stay out of the wetlands, stay out of the river, minimize impacts to the archaeological sites. Not a big cost difference, not a big construction duration difference, but a big environmental impact difference. They have made some minor vertical alignment changes, and this was done to um, better balance the earthwork on the projects. So you have a certain amount of earth that you have to dig, uh, and you have to have somewhere to put it. So a lot of times they'll actually adjust the vertical grade of a project to instead of hauling dirt off site or hauling dirt on site, which is expensive and it leads to lots of trucks on the roads. And, and uh, uh, you know, anytime you put trucks hauling dirt and stone on the road, you're tracking mud on the road, you have conflicts with passenger cars, more accidents. So they did that to minimize the amount of dirt they're hauling off or onto the site. That was to be expected from us. They've also advanced their, their grading plans and their stormwater management plans. So now we're, we're better, better able to see, okay, what is this stormwater management basin really gonna look like? 
uh, you know, what are the impacts? What, you know, how does the grading fit with the rest of the roadway? So that's uh, some of the advancements that they've made. And they've made some minor changes to crossing culverts. Uh, generally, these are small streams. Uh, they're trying to make those culverts as short as possible. And, and Morgan, I'm, I'm sure you can appreciate this. The shorter that culvert is, the better it is for the environment uh, and for the animals that would like to uh, use that stream or live in that stream. Um, so that's been a big focus of theirs uh, from the 30% of the technical proposal till now. Does anybody have any questions about what we did in the over-the-shoulder review, how that worked, what we're going to be doing in the future on other uh, over-the-shoulder review projects? And so that, if they think it's helpful to know what's happened between the 30% plan and the on the website and what may be going on now. I was looking back to the proposal and looking at the 30% plans to prepare for this discussion today. And, um, it looks as I was trying to follow it as best I could, but the changes between VDOT's conceptual plan and the 30% plans, it looks like they have suggested, I think one thing they highlighted the proposal was not entirely certain what this means, but they chose a tangent crossing of the river to reduce the length of the bridge and to reduce some of the potential impacts. Yes. Are you, is there any way you could elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, on the southern portion of the project, just that area of the crossing of the river and just a little bit to the north of the river, um, <clears throat> Lane Corman decided that they would rather kind of change the, the alignment of the bridge as it crosses the river. It made for a, a tangent section means there are no curves on the bridge. It's easier to construct, it's cheaper to construct. Uh, they also changed the vertical alignment a little bit and the touchdown points. Uh, specifically on the north side, which allowed them to shorten the bridge, which obviously cut costs for them. It was a strategic thing to do to, to help win uh, the project. But it also cuts down a long-term maintenance costs. It's less square footage of bridge that VDOT has to maintain in the future. Uh, you know, it in, it um, helps them achieve the uh, project completion date or incentive dates better uh, with no adverse impact to the environment or the project. That was the stipulation that we had. There are some archaeological sites located on the north side of the river, and the stipulation was you can't encroach on those archaeological sites. If you do, you may have to go back to square one with a longer bridge. Um, so far, we've not seen that there's been any increase in environmental impact, and that's part of the environmental studies that they're doing right now and those reports that we're getting, and we want to make sure that that's not occurring. They've also, one of the other benefits is They've reduced the number of piers. They only have two piers, so it's a three-span structure, two piers, reduces impacts to floodplains and, and other resources. That's what I picked up on was it was actually the shorter bridge allowed them to avoid some potential impacts rather than the longer bridge. There was more of a chance. To come. And that weighed into our evaluation when we were evaluating all the offers and scoring the technical proposals. That was part of that evaluation. And then the other piece of notice was roundabouts, it sounds like, will be at a couple of the intersections with Berkmar and the, the streets it crosses over. The southern terminus of the project is at Hilton Heights and Berkmar, an existing intersection, and that will be a roundabout that is shown on the plans that has not changed. The northern terminus, the only other actual intersection on the project, is an existing roundabout at Town Center Drive. Right. So there will be roundabouts on either end of the project. And it still it crosses over Rio Mills Road also. It does, in the air. The bridge spans Rio Mills Road. Um, that was, there was a major limitation on grade. Uh, it's so far below the existing topography. When you drive down Rio Mills, you see that steep slope there. That we couldn't make the grade work anyway if we wanted to tie in. Um, Ravana Water and Sewer Authority also requested that we span prior mills. They prefer that they have facilities there to access the dam. Um, so that was one of their uh, input as, as a stakeholder in that design. Yeah. One, sorry if I'm keeping anyone else from the questions, <laughs> but uh, we'd also talked a little bit about the architectural treatment for the bridge. Yes. Um, and I think where we ended up was that uh, the bridge itself, both sort of inside of it as you're driving or walking or biking across it, but also the outside, if you're seeing it from below or from a distance, have similar treatments to what has been 
accepted in for the Rio energy use. Is that yes, right? and also John Warner Parkway and McIntyre. This, it's kind of a common theme. So as you're driving through the area, you see these bridges that look similar. It, it's very much like John Warner Parkway, the bridges that you see now with the shared use path and the wall between them and the architectural treatments and the open rail so you can see through. Uh, it is required on the interior and exterior of the bridge, but not below the substructure, not below the superstructure, I guess, which is the deck. You know, that's going to be traditional columns. You were on the river looking up, you mean? You would see steel beams right. and you would see concrete columns going up. Um, yeah, like a lot of bridges. But the sides and the inside. Like the exterior walls, the railings, all that will look just like the interior. So if you're looking at it from, if you're staying at the double tree and you look out the window and you can see the bridge, you'll see that, that same aesthetic treatment on the exterior wall. Thanks for going into all that. Not a problem. Happy to do it. Any other questions? Yeah. You mentioned the shortening of culverts. Mm -hmm. My question is, how did you accomplish that? You had to trade some stuff. Well, not necessarily. No? Well, first of all, vertical alignment. You know, if, you, if you're in a big fill, and you're way above the stream, if you push it down a little bit, the culvert gets shorter. There's also possibly some opportunities where we have multiple streams coming in uh, and, and converging into one stream where we might be able to do some natural stream design or some relocation of that stream and have a, a perpendicular crossing of the road as opposed to a skewed crossing of the road. So there's, there's various ways of doing that. They're looking for all the opportunities that they can. And this is part of that final design process where you know, they were putting together a technical proposal and it was fast and furious and, and they said, well, we'll put this in. There's some doubt. Maybe this needs to be 140 feet. Maybe it needs to be 115 feet. We're not sure. We'll opt for 140 to be sure. Now they're going back and looking at all those little details. And we'll still see, we'll see all that when we have 60% six, six mill. <coughs> Any other questions? Phil, do I have time now to circle back to that you did. item? Okay. You go right ahead. One of the recommendations that this panel had early on in the development of the request for qualifications and request for proposals was a local job fair. And I'd like to just touch on that for a few minutes. Uh, Lane Corman told me this week they are going to have a local job fair so that local uh, contractors, skilled laborers, unskilled laborers, trucking companies, material suppliers can come to them and, and hear about what the project is and hear about what the expectations are and opportunities. Uh, we don't have a date set for that yet, but we think it's probably going to be sometime this summer. Um, but I'd like to also talk a little bit about what they've told us about using local labor. And there's a 13% disadvantaged business enterprise DBE requirement in the contract. Um, this is pretty standard. There's always a, a DBE requirement in our contracts. This one's probably a little bit higher than some others. Uh, they are, their goal is to use as much local forces to meet that DBE requirement as possible. 13% of $116 million is $15.2 million that they're looking for right here in the local community, the Charlottesville, Albemarle area to meet that, that uh, requirement. In addition to that, they're looking to use as much uh, local labor as possible outside of that DBE requirement. And the number that we're hearing right now is their expectation is uh, $25 million of, of local labor and services uh, here right in Albemarle County in Charlottesville. So if anybody is in contact with you know, small contracting companies or laborers, you know, Lane Corman would directly hire a lot of these folks to work as an employee of them uh, on these projects, then you know, stay in touch on this. And once we have a date set and a location, we'll certainly make all of you aware that uh, people can go and learn more about that program and, and how they can be a part of it. Can, can the city and county maybe participate in the like, communication of that? I mean, Absolutely. The county has a website that a lot of contractors are on frequently. 
Yes. Uh, things like that. So that communication is. It'll be in the local papers. It'll be on our website. We'd ask for assistance from the county and the city, and I'm sure we'll very happy. <coughs> Dave, I know we don't have a date, but do we have a date by which we expect to have a date? <laughs> I mean, let, let's can can we can we work on that? This is this is something that you know I've been having a lot of dialogue with Lane Corman about lately, and I'm going to continue to do that. Okay. So I can provide an update by the next meeting. Hopefully, we have a date by then. Yeah, that'd be but good. There's a lot of planning that has to yeah, go into this, I agree. and I don't think we want to be premature because we want to make sure. No, I, I agree. I agree. I agree with that. I think I may have mentioned to the panel once before on another project I worked on when we had this first job fair, a thousand people showed up for 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 jobs. I mean, these are. These are good jobs. Yeah, we are. Uh, so I'm with you on planning carefully. It, it's just it, just keep us keep us tuned in yeah. on on the planning. So as early as possible, we we know when the date is, so we can get advertisements and get words out, as opposed to you know. It's happening on Saturday. No, no, yeah. no, no. And it's not in, in Lane Corman's best interest to do that either. No. They, they want this local talent yeah. there. They don't want to bring people from Northern Virginia or Hampton Roads or North Carolina, their own people that they already have allocated to projects. They want to use people that, that know the local area. Uh, and, and just a little glimpse of scale. At any one given time, there's going to be hundreds of people working on these projects. I mean, literally, Rio alone, in that summertime period, there will be probably a couple hundred people working day and night uh, on that project alone, not to mention 29 widening and work more extended. And to project that a little bit, the, the increase in the impact of the local economy is going to be staggering. People shop where they live and where they work. And people are going to be visiting local restaurants, hotels, gas stations. I think we're going to see a major impact from that. So uh, Lane Corman's making a big commitment here. We may see you know, more than $25 million. We don't know yet, but here. Three in the world and job fairs every year, I think, two of them. We do one a year. One a year. Maybe you can talk to them. They have so many every year they do it and we're successful. We can certainly coordinate with you on that and maybe have a booth there at, at your job fair to, to you know, help. Just last people. week, sorry. Oh, just last <laughs> week. <laughs> yeah, we did oh, have it last week. That's well, right. We just missed it, but okay. there is going to be a big effort. They do really, truly want to use local people for, for good reason, for all the right reasons. So, could you briefly explain what a DBE is? A disadvantaged business enterprise are normally minority uh, companies that you know, there's a, a certain portion of the contract that is required to go to these types of firms that are registered with the Department of Minority Business Affairs. So they, they register with uh, Department of Minority Business Affairs and therefore they're eligible to meet that requirement uh, for the prime contractor. There's a registration and certification process to there, be sure. I think there are a few different acronyms underneath DBE, right? There, there, there are several different acronyms. Well, you're probably thinking of SWAM. Yes, yeah, small yeah. minority. Business. That's a different. Uh, the DBE is is a woman-owned or or minority-owned generally, right? Woman-owned. Some or minority SWAM owned. firms can be DBE as well. Some SWAM firms can. can. SWAM is a, a broader jet. Definition. Uh, I, just, I, mean, I, I, I was aware of the, the. I didn't. I didn't know the percentage on this project, but I was certainly aware that it was a threshold on, on these type of projects. I was just yeah, hopeful that we all understood what that what that barrier is. And I, I don't even know. I don't have any idea. Uh, I'll bring some information. I'll, I'll bring some information back to the May 28th meeting. It, it, just sure. some general information. And the best way to look at DBE is that's more of a federal mm -hmm. kind of thing. SWAM and those kind of things are more state because different states have different acronyms. Um, but if it's not DBE, then 
it doesn't apply to this situation. Well, if, if it's anything like the SWIM, the, the criteria and the process to get to get stamped is incredibly difficult. It's even more for DBE. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> well, the, the one, one difference is, the, 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 well, the criteria is, is very strict. I mean, oh, yeah. you have to meet yeah. very strict requirements, otherwise it doesn't apply. But there is a whole department that exists to help businesses get DBE status that are eligible to qualify. And that's the Department of Minority Business Affairs. So. Minority Business Enterprise. 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 Any other questions about their intent for job fair and hiring local contractors and personnel? Okay, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, place naming. This uh, continues. Uh, this was the, the general plan that we looked at the last meeting. You mentioned that we've been through the first two pieces. Uh, the, next, the next item is really to uh, approach items three and four together, create some straw man names, straw person names to test, uh, as well as share and discuss with stakeholder, uh, stakeholder groups. And go on to the next slide. I've worked with uh, VDOT Central Office in Communications, and I've discussed this with Mark and uh, VDOT is going, to, is going to absorb the cost for taking the first step into this place naming process that, as we talked on April the 30th, can feed into the small area of planning. And what SIR, that's the group, John, will you remember when John Martin was, the other John Martin was here, uh, <clears throat> as proposed, a, um, a process to conduct focus group sessions with Route 29 RIO business owners. Uh, their proposal is to have um, meetings with two groups of owners in each quadrant. So that would be eight total focus group sessions. Uh, their target schedule they suggested was June I think that's probably be June, July, depending on how we move forward. They would want to meet in a facility or facilities located near the intersection. We talked about the library possibly being, being one. Ideally, I believe they would like to conduct the meetings in each of the quadrants, but if that's not possible, have them in one central place in the intersection. Uh, each session include 8 to 12 participants, and what SIR is looking for is as many contacts of businesses that we can possibly pull together in the area that they would draw these participants from. And Lou and I are working on consolidating the VDOT list, the county list, and we're going to talk to the chamber, which would be very helpful there. Uh, SIR would prepare a draft interview guide that they would use at this um, at the focus groups, as well as suggested names to test. And they would take those suggested names to test from the names that we've discussed here. If you'll call last time, we had two or three pages of names that had come from, from the group. When they get that together, our plan is to get that together over the next two weeks and then come back to you with a draft interview guide that would include these suggested names, uh, a little more flesh around the, the bones of how to conduct the focus group sessions uh, to keep this independent. It's not going to be moderated by, by VDOT or the county. SIR would moderate the sessions, we would have the results uh, back in July or the month following when they were conducted, uh, and then present a recommendation to VDOT in August, which keeps us ahead of the schedule you've asked us to consider uh, today. Uh, 
so that's that's the general plan for the next step. Uh, and remember, when we say present recommendation to VDOT, that would be a recommendation possibly for the area as well as the quadrants or corners or whatever they end up being, being uh, called. And this would then feed into the schedule and the work for the small area study. And if you recall last time, Mark said that, I think Mark saw some value in doing this early and having that as input into the small area plan. And if you'll recall, the reason we need to get a recommendation to VDOT is because after the end of the year, Dave needs some some firm recommendations on sign legends, uh, what would be on, on the sign. That's the general plan. Uh, thoughts? Bring something back to you in two weeks then on the I mean, is it this group's desire that this continue? I don't want it to just be mine, but I'm okay with that, but I don't want it to be. Okay, all right, good. And we're gonna keep this moving, gonna keep this moving forward. Um, I'll talk to John tomorrow at SIR and tell them that we need to have a bit more, we've got a pretty good proposal from them, but just a little bit more of the tactics behind it. Uh, Lou, I'll talk to you and we'll get on assembling that list. Uh, and then we'll have this interview guide. And I think the importance there is that we don't want, I don't want it to be a situation where SIR goes into a room and has a discussion with a group of people and you all don't have input into how that discussion takes place or what the interview discussion uh, guide is for those those discussions. Okay. Questions? Karen? How long would the focus group last? I think they I I think ninety minutes. I if I recall from the proposal ninety ninety minutes uh, you know, there would probably be uh, some small, there generally is some small stipend for the participants, maybe a $50 gift card. I've suggested that if there is a stipend and if there is a gift card, it come from businesses located around the, the area. Uh, but 90, 90 minutes, a 90 minute session. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's a commitment of somebody's time for, for a while. I was part of one that tested a new label for early times bourbon <laughs> back in the 1970s. I've been buying early times ever since. Did you sample it? Ever since then. There was a little sample in there. <laughs> and they gave us 10 bucks. I mean, you know, that was uh, for a 20 year old kid or whatever old I was. That was a pretty good deal. Did they have uh, different <laughs> brands? What were you testing? It was testing changing the label. Okay. From the old early times label to whatever it is, I don't. So they just. I just remember you, doing okay. it. Okay, so they give you several alternatives to the label. Several alternatives to the label, or keeping the label the same, and I was the lone boat for keeping the label the same. But I still got my ten bucks. <laughs> I don't know why I remember that, but anyway. <laughs> okay. All right. I really appreciate you all your patience and support as we continue that effort because uh, like the lighting, like the lighting, this is an opportunity to do something more than just build a project. It's an opportunity to, to, to leave a, 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 positive, a positive influence behind and uh, I think the lightings and the names are, are opportunities that we don't want to let get by us. Um, any new business? Pete, any wrap up? Um, 
Chip. So, Morgan, there. Brad. Chris. Just a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, meeting dates, because I had this for the year last time, but it has 2015, July 14th. But are we still doing our regular scheduling? So May 28th, what about June? <laughs> Oh, we have a schedule for, we already have June scheduled. I'm sorry. That just picked, yes, I, I, that's a very good question. Yes, that's just picking up. We have our June meeting scheduled. Yes. And we'll stick with that schedule. Okay, and then we'll jump over. Yes. Fourth of July holiday and go back into it. Yes. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Henry? Well, uh, since we are at signage, since I, early on, I presented some yes. proposal mm -hmm. that I thought uh, was somewhat creative mm -hmm. and also would allow you to direct people to businesses, especially those that were landmarks. And essentially, the signage would be dual purpose because most of that signage would be also permanent, but it may not be meet the exact requirements of the TOTS program. Is that idea dead? No, 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 it's not, it's not dead and it's not, there's no idea that's dead. And as Dave knows, you know, we might push the limits of a few programs as they've traditionally been identified. There's going to be some limits we're going to push up against and get told no can do. <laughs> but uh, we haven't got there. We haven't got there yet, yet. I think the point right now, Henry and John has expressed this to me, is there aren't any bad ideas. That it's real important that we not start categorizing ideas until we get through this process and let the the businesses themselves be be more involved. And that makes sense to me. Well, because earlier today we heard about the TOTS program. And yeah. If you do TOTS, you're not going to do this kind of conglomerate of, on a few signs well. leading to uh, the, the, the most noticeable business on each one of the quadrants. Now, we've got the, the two discussions going on, you know, what the overhead signs, how those might look and be labeled. And then the signs for the the shoulder mounted signs in the in the quadrants. So we've got both of those discussions going on. This focus group would be more oriented toward the post construction <coughs> picture. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But the way the little scheme I proposed. No, I know. The post construction and the during construction would almost be the same except for some detailed yes. panels that were added to the top. No, I, I, we've got we've got that. Okay, so absolutely. You're managing it. We've got it. Yes. <laughs> Anything else? No, no. Go ahead. Uh, I, I'll ask. Um, some of the businesses that have. Um, Frontage in the Rio intersection. I don't know what's, doing, what's happening at, at the 250, but um, <clears throat> landscaping and, and grass cutting and things like that. There are several stakes in the ground that I assume everybody wants to stay in the ground. Um, and so the landscaping companies are asking for more compensation as it takes more time, and, and um, or they're just running them over, and um, which is going to require more time and, and effort from the engineers. Thoughts on that? Considerations was going on. That's a good point. It is a good point. And a common problem. <laughs> it, it, is, it is. I can tell you that contractors deal with that issue of people removing stakes, moving stakes, destroying stakes quite frequently. And it's just part of their operations that they plan for. We'd like for it not to happen. Um, I think we can go back and talk specifically about is there something we can do to make it easier on the landscaping companies or to deal with that issue. Yeah, let's talk about it more. You could just okay. take the lawn mowing contract over. In that, in that I thought that's where that was going. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like the resources are already fit. Just an idea. 
Maybe you can get back to me next meeting. Well, we will do that. Essentially, those are easements, right? Construction easements. Some are larger now than they were a month ago. Yeah. 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 But, but I mean, my point is they're going to be working in there, and, and we don't know when or how long or whatever, but I mean, certainly would be a, a sign of good faith. Well, well, you know, that's a good point, two, what, two ways there, because if it is a stake, it is in an easement area, right? Yes. It's so. So who's responsible for maintaining the easement? Right. It's right the letter now, even on 29 where the sidewalk is, and yeah. there's a little stip, strip of grass. Every landscape contractor I've talked to in the last five years has told me that's VDOT's responsibility, yet it never gets cut yeah. unless we VDOT cut it. Doesn't it. Yeah. So now we're moving that up even further, so who's, yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, because yeah. actually the landscape company shouldn't be in there. But you can't leave it unmaintained. Well, Joel, all, all the county has, has an ordinance on Yeah, the right, so right. Actually, all that is And now it's stagnant water. Mosquitoes. If, if you guys leave any buckets. Yeah, no, watch your buckets. I was going to say all entrance corridors in El Morro County are under permit uh, for landscaping and maintenance by the county. So they cut 250, 29, uh, Barracks Road. Everything on there about 12 quarters. But let, let's. So we need to actually, we need to coordinate with. Yeah. Permit let's think about these sure easement that, areas. Yeah. Well, let's yeah. put it this way there is a requirement for certain maintenance activities within construction zone easements uh, and right of way. And we'll go back and look and first of all, see what our contract says. Yeah. And then <clears> second of all, figure out what's the best approach to that. We certainly don't want um, anyone, whether it be a a property owner or a landscape company to be doing something dangerous in a work zone adjacent to active war. So we'll look into that now. Um, we can probably provide an answer to that before the next meeting. But Dave, it is a concern. Thanks for bringing it up. We'll it's good. Okay. I have one thing, if there's anything yes, else that I would like to just bring up that I forgot to mention earlier. With regard to the Rio Great Separated Intersection Utility Relocation Effort, just please be aware that it is not only Lane Corman's personnel that are doing utility relocations. For instance, on Dominion Drive this week, they began, actually they started it a week or two ago, but um, this week you'll see a ramp up to relocations by CenturyLink. So CenturyLink, some of the other utility owners, Dominion Virginia Power and their contractors will be doing relocations periodically. All this is being coordinated with Lane Corman. Um, we are trying very hard to get the message across to the uh, utility owners that there's rules they need to play by to. They don't always play by those rules. Sometimes they just go out and do a lane closure. But, um, if something like that happens, please bring it to our attention and we'll, we'll deal with it. So, so these utility companies that are doing the work you're referencing now aren't doing it under contract to VDOT or to Lane Corman? Correct. They're There's agreements between Lane Corman and mm -hmm. the utility owners, uh, specifically um, CenturyLink, uh, <clears throat> where they are installing what they call remote switches in uh -huh. three locations. The one they're working on right now is on Dominion Drive, okay. the southern terminus of the project. Um, and, and they're doing that work entirely on their own. Okay. So we're, we're not assisting them. Lane Corman's not assisting them. So just as part of this project, project, are they governed by the lane closure yes. restrictions? Yes. Okay. So another idea of the time lapse video could certainly show evidence. Well, of it, it may, but what, what our goal is, is to communicate with them so that that problem never happens. Sure. I but I'm sure there will be an instance or two where a contractor to one of these utility owners just comes in and does it, and, and we have to go out and say, stop, you can't close this lane, you have to do this work at night time. But I just wanted if one of these issues clear. comes up and there's a question, we can get it to you, and yes. you can work yes. with them. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, and we'll see you May 28th.